fired from sub-basement D of a major motion picture studio. The development executives must go to the last places in Hollywood with money. Now streaming, Reboot It! Welcome back to my old stomping grounds, Sony Pictures. Hello, Reboot crew. Look, you all look so cute. You look cute. Yes, you do. Tell me your names. I have to know your names. Uh, I am producer Bill. I'm Billy Business. I am Ron Swallow. And I am Ed Greer. <laughs> Ooh, Ed Greer, you're a cutie patootie. <laughs> no funny business, though. That's not what we do here. That's not how we work. If it helps any, that's not how we do things either. No, never. Never do it that way. Well, that's disappointing. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ask Scott Rudin how I'm kidding. No, don't, don't, don't. He's, he's in a lawsuit. Don't talk to him. <laughs> Woo! Off to a good start. Listen, we're happy to be here. Well, and I'm happy to have you here because Sony just got this new output deal with Netflix and they need content. And I said, just give me all of your biggest franchises. I know how to produce big franchises. So the first one out the gate, they said they're doing this new Ghostbusters. I'm going to be honest with you. It's the bomb. It hasn't come out yet. I already know it's going to bomb. Wait, is it the bomb or a bomb? I'm not sure which one. Don't get cute with me, you little tease. Don't get cute. But seriously, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be a huge, huge bomb. So I said, screw it. We do things differently at Sony. Let's just get a new reboot going immediately. Let's just pretend, let's just pretend it didn't even happen, okay? That's all we need to do. So you guys, you're here because you're the franchise builders. That's what they tell me. So you're going to give me a brand new Ghostbusters so that we can go and make a billion dollars. Just like I did with Spider-Man. Marvel, they say they did it. I did it. Do the same with Ghostbusters. Okay. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Wow. Okay. This, is, this is one of the weirdest mandates we've ever had. So we are rebooting a reboot that hasn't come out yet, apparently. The corpse is still warm. It's, <laughs> it might even be alive. I don't know. This, thing, this thing's not even dead. I don't know. What is even <laughs> happening right now? I, know, I mean, um, look, it has all the Stranger Things kids in it. I think it'll do fine. I mean, I, it is very much Sony's MO to already have your next reboot on deck. They are like the sure. NASA of reboots. You just got to have a contingency at all times. Well, yeah, I, I mean, wanted to tell her uh, she was a woman after our own hearts, but uh, I didn't want her to like start grabbing my stuff. I mean, she kind of sounded like a weird Don Bluth character. <laughs> did, you mean, did you mean grabbing your franchises, Ed? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm just cupping my franchises and jostling them around. So, uh, dude, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, guys, how are we all feeling about Ghostbusters? Because I want to get this out up front. We are not all equally fans, are we, Billy? <laughs> Is this throw Billy under the bus again? Well, you know, I would say you can go ahead and click up here or up here to go find my uh, Hot Takes episode where I talked about Ghostbusters. But yeah, look, I tried. I even tried, full disclosure, to watch Ghostbusters again for, for this to get a better idea. I just, I'm sorry. I, it's just not for me. Like, I just don't dig it. I, I it's just not my thing. I actually kind of liked the 2016 reboot. Uh, it, like, I'd rather watch that than the older ones. And now watch the thumbs down start piling up. But uh, Ghostbusters really just isn't my thing. You would think it would be. You'd think I'd be all over this, but not my thing. Huh. I don't. I don't think one way or another. I just think it's interesting. I myself am a huge fan of the original Ghostbusters movie. I grew up watching the real Ghostbusters cartoon, that original cartoon series they came out with. Still one of the greatest conceptions of the boogeyman ever put on screen. Ed, Ron, what are your connections to Ghostbusters? Go, Ron. 
Well, I mean, I watched it uh, with my parents and family. So, you know, there's some good memories there. I feel like it's a fun movie. Um, this is the beautiful thing about art, though. It's subjective. Like, we're allowed to dislike and, and like what we like to like. And, uh, and, and I still think that there's room for improvement. And there was also, uh, you know, some problems in that movie as well that, you know, making it today, we probably change. Are you saying you would take out Blowjob Ghost? I would actually take out Blowjob Ghost. No. Total mistake. I'm just kidding. Total I mistake. would make Blowjob Ghost even more relevant. <laughs> <laughs> That's the we're, way to do it. We're going for website business, my friends. Well, technically, they have Blowjob Ghost twice with uh, Slimer putting all those hot dogs in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Ed, how much do you love that? <laughs> uh, Slimer is a role model. No, uh, I look Ghostbusters to me is really cool. And I'll just do uh, instead in lieu of going how much I like it. This is why it's good. It's good because it's got working class ethos on top of all that parapsychology and frou-frou stuff. That meld right there is the whole juice of it. That part I like. They've built a lot of houses and stuff on the outskirts of that little township. I don't like none of that stuff. I like the, these guys are basically plumbers of ghosts. Love it. So that's where I'm at with this whole jazz. That's what I like about this whole thing. Well, let's do our quick recap for those of you at home who might not be familiar with Ghostbusters. It started, of course, as a 1984 movie written and created by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, co-starring the great Bill Murray and as Winston Zeddemore, Ernie Hudson, who, in my opinion, steals more of the show than you really think he could in the 10 minutes of screen time he has. With amazing supporting turns from Rick Moranis and Sigourney Weaver, and, of course, Annie Potts as Janine. The original Ghostbusters featured disgraced NYU parapsychologists taking up a real working man struggle to rid New York of its ghost infestation. It got a sequel in 1989 with Ghostbusters 2, much less well-received than the original, which began sort of a slow downslide for the franchise. Simultaneously, though, the real Ghostbusters cartoon premiered on television, which ran for a whopping seven seasons seasons from 1986 until 1991. The Ghostbusters branched out into things like comic books, subsequent animated series, and after a long, simmering, gestating reboot was on the table, finally it came out in 2016 and just lit the internet on fire. A bunch of people just could not countenance the fact that they were turning Ghostbusters into a woke social justice vehicle, starring an all-female cast. Aghast, people. They were aghast. And that movie was kind of sank before it began. Now we are coming up on another Ghostbusters reboot, kind of billing itself as the true Ghostbusters 3, directed by the original director's son, Ivan Reitman's son, Jason Reitman. It was supposed to come out last year during the pandemic and is coming out this summer, and already people seem to be lukewarm on it. So guys, here we are. We don't even know what's going to happen, but pretending that one doesn't happen whatsoever, what do you think people are going to expect out of the new, new flavor of Ghostbusters. What are they bringing into this? Hmm. A, a lot Don't of Don't look at me. Don't look at me. I have no idea. Oh, I'll I mean, say that, I mean, yeah. I'll say this. This franchise has almost too much baggage. And I don't say that we as I don't say that as if we shouldn't be doing it, but Ghostbusters, I, I don't know if if you can even properly recall how much of a lightning rod that 2016 movie was. And it devolved into very sort of Trumpian arguments where it's like the people who just had a bone to pick, doubled down, found every flaw in it. There were flaws to find, but the people who rightly called out those haters as being just having a political agenda started to irrationally defend it and it almost became about something that wasn't even the movie or the franchise, but it really now is just this weird lightning rod. And if I had to play prognosticator, I think that this new movie is going to land with a resounding thud, partly because of that, partly because it's billing itself as a weird writing of the ship. 
I don't know, man. I just I feel like this is going to be a franchise that's tainted for a while. Am I off base? I have to say I was taken aback by how much people even cared about Ghostbusters in 2016 because up until that point, yeah, that video game came out and like a smattering of people that I knew kind of talked about it. They like reunited the cast in like 2009 or something for a video game. Mm -hmm. But other than that, like Ghostbusters wasn't this like sacred thing that was untouchable until from at least from my vantage point until 2016, where all of a sudden it was like, don't you dare touch Ghostbusters. I guess I just never thought that it was in that, that realm. So people going into this, I kind of think maybe this is uh, a Kobayashi Maru movie. There might be no way to win on this because Egon, why am I blanking on his name? Harold Ramis. Ramis. Harold Ramis passed away. Right. Uh, the other three, you know, I think if it was going to happen, it would have happened. I just like, it's never going to be what you thought Ghostbusters 3 should be in like 1990, I don't know, two, three. Like, it just can't be that. So, I don't know. I almost, I think the audience, no matter what we do, is going to find something wrong with it. Fair. I mean, Ed, I think that also... Oh. Sorry, Ron. No, it's okay. I think that also gives us the option to kind of do whatever we want. I mean, you know, if if people are going to have a a, a dumb opinion anyways, why don't we just do whatever we want to do and make it as fun and interesting as we possibly can? That's interesting. I mean, I think that um, maybe the Sony Spider-Man movies kind of give us a template here because you look at the Spider-Man movies and I mean, they have rebooted that three times in the past 10 years between the Amazing Spider-Man movies, the Marvel Spider-Man movies, and also Spider-Verse. So maybe this is our Spider-Verse of Ghostbusters? I don't know. Ed, thoughts? I mean, I, I really think, yeah, obviously there needs to be more imagination um, tied to the concept. And again, I don't want to beat the same drum, but some part of this is making it in here that these are guys with jobs. I think yeah. that, when there's, that when people start taking this as some sort of like super heroic, oh, it got passed down to my kids and the blah, 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 blah. I'm not talking about that specific new movie. I'm just talking about like the anime version of Ghostbusters that would have been made around 2014. It would definitely be some kind of ancient secret society of Ghostbusters. And this is the latest iteration in the bloodline of the ghosts. Ugh. Ernie Hudson is the best character in that movie because he rolls 100%. up and just needs a I job. Have like, I have a crazy <laughs> idea and I'm just going to throw it out now so we can poop on it and move on. But Ed, what if <laughs> to, to have your idea, what if the Ghostbusters were all the guys in that men in black scene that didn't pass the test to become a man in black. And they knew that there was stuff out there and they wanted to do something, (laughs) but they just weren't good enough to actually become like men in black agents. And you combine those two universes. So the men in black are like the jocks and the preps and the ghostbusters are kind of your ragtag, you know, your bad news bears. In the world where we just need to keep one-upping ourselves, do we not just cross over with Men in Black? Do we cross over with any and every horror franchise Sony might have? You know what I mean? Like, there's a the real... I'm I don't know who has The Conjuring, but it's just like, oh, snap. <laughs> Imagine, like, you think you're going to see, you know, The Conjuring, and all of a sudden, three plumbers with ecto thing, plasma <laughs> things on their back bust through. Dude, guys, I'm just going to throw some stuff out here. You know, feel free to jump on it if you want to. Okay. So we do ha- we have from Sony The Craft. We have Insidious. Hmm. Um, we have the Slender Man movie, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we have Bram Stoker's Dracula at Sony. <laughs> we have the Grudge franchise. Ooh. We have Resident Evil. <laughs> and we have we have Zombieland. I mean, okay, th- this is what this is what I'm thinking. If we have access to all these worlds, we have also access to either showing them or depicting them or riffing on them because they're all under the same umbrella. So all that being said, I I don't know if we have to make it a necessarily multiverse movie, but if it was, I wouldn't be mad at it. I wouldn't be mad at the fact that we around the 80s or if we don't want to acknowledge the previous stuff, that's fine. But whenever we started busting ghosts, we grabbed them and we just threw them in some pocket dimension. 
But why do we know that that was the right thing to do? It was just the expedient thing that the smartest people at the time decided to do. But that could have super ramifications across the lattice, the intricate lattice work of the multiverse, stuffing one dimension we just came upon full of our, our, our dregs, our ghost. We crapped our ghost dregs, our toxic crap into the bloodstream of the multiverse, guys. And there must be consequences. Well, that original movie does show you that when you shut down, when you shut down the trap or I forget what they called it, but whatever their their mainframe is, uh, you get yourself an explosion of ghosts and mystical energy. So there's it's kind of canon already, isn't it? I know. So, yeah, I'm just saying like something like that, like like we're, we're we have plumbers. But again, again, what we just said, that giant grand idea, plumbers got to solve it. You know what I'm saying? Dude from ICT Tech, straight up, got to solve it. They're smart. The, yeah. the original Ghostbusters were blue collar dudes that did. They mm-hmm. weren't just me. They were like, I know how to change my own tire and change my oil. On the weekends, I get quite dirty. I also have a parapsychology degree. You know what I mean? I mean that's that's kind of why I initially thought Men in Black would be great, kind of like antagonists to them in a way, because it's just like they are so efficient and they have all these gadgets and gas gadgets and whatever. So it's like to to bring in, you know, it's almost like you almost rip out the formula from like Mystery Men, where Greg Kinnear gets taken out in the first act and then you have to kind of assemble your ragtag like do you kind of borrow from that a little bit you know well what about what about kind of going with the uh formula from twister where you've got like the teched out carrie yule's team (laughs) you know what i mean and then scrappy you know we're doing this by our bootstrap team that's kind of what we're talking about here if you're doing ghostbusters versus men in black i think that's carrie elway's so people look at he's like, as you wish. That's 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 and, and then saw he saw it's this. Not you, it's not it's not it's not Newell's. I think it's, 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 I think it's El, Elvis. Yeah, I think that's what it is. But anyway, the bottom line is you. that guy, you. the Dread Pirate Roberts, yeah, yes. and, and Homeboy and Twister leading a great team. I I like I like the great <laughs> team versus the crappy team. I'm always down to bad news bears it. I just if it if it has me in men in black I don't care but I, I don't know that it's super necessary I, I think I want us to have guys who are really super root againstable in the end the men in black are good guys you know I do, but like the guys that would be put in charge of ghosts the the tip of the spear of the government dealing with ghosts wouldn't be fun loving plumbers it would be assholes and military dudes so I just think anybody like well, that would I, be hard I love. Them. I love the idea of that. I would like to see them come together at the end because, you know, I love stuff like that. So we get <laughs> the crazy. Tech I, guys I, 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 I kind of I they, usually I roll my eyes, but man, could you imagine your third act? You have freaking the men in black plus some Ghostbusters going after one big thing like that's a trailer, baby. That's a dude, trailer. I'm telling you, I can, I'm I, can, telling I, can you, I can give it. I, I think I think you treat this. um you don't treat this where the men in black are the antagonists. It's like a jurisdictional issue, right? So it's almost like, and I know I know how this goes in the movie, but in the movie, the other guys with Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg, the men in black are essentially Samuel L. Jackson and The Rock. They're just the bigger dog on the block. And just in our movie, they don't all get killed. Or maybe they do. I mean, you well, know, I maybe think it is. would be interesting too if like the men in black, like we do aliens, like... We, we tried to get this go. We don't know what we're doing, you know? So it's just like, if the, if the men in black are just like, what do we do? And they're thumbing through the, I don't know, phone book, if it's in the eighties or nineties, but it's just like, there's, it's just something interesting to like, who does the exterminator call when he has pests in his house type of thing, you know? I mean, like I said, I would love opening scene of the men in black snapping into action, trying to fight a Cthulhu, and you they Pulling whip out the building. little gun and all the stuff, and then they just get straight murdered. And it then it's like, oh. thing, yeah. And then there's a then there's a thumb going down the phone book, like, okay. <laughs> and, you know, it, You're gonna they own, dude, because they own so many. Yes, exactly. And because Sony owns so many things, I think put Dracula's up in it. I don't care. I'm willing to get as nuts as you guys want to get. I'm just saying we have so many places to get nuts because Sony owns so many um hypernatural, supernatural properties. I mean, if nothing else, we can bring all of those characters as ghosts and make them do funny things. Dracula trying to suck someone's blood when he's a ghost and he can't suck any blood. I mean, that's comedy to me. I don't, I, I just, there's a lot of options. We don't have to cross over. I'm just trying to think of like, what could make this damn thing fresh at this point, you know? 
Well, Ed, you said a Cthulhu shows up and kills everybody. I mean, one of the interesting things about that original Ghostbusters movie is the ending is kind of a Cthulhu. I mean, Gozer the Gozerian Mm -hmm. is essentially a Cenobite. Like, it's a very sort of cosmic horror setup. I think if we have our backs up against the wall narratively to some sort of Armageddon, to some sort of cosmic horror show that's about to happen... It's a really good ticking clock, and I almost start to get a, honestly, I almost start to get a Michael Bay's Armageddon get out of this, yeah. right? mm. where the Ghostbusters are the oil drillers and the men in black are NASA, and it's like, how do we come together to fight this extra dimensional alien horror show? I don't know. Feels kind of hot. It's funny that you said that because my mind thought of of Armageddon earlier, but it's just like, I think that's almost the exact like setup that I was not quite as eloquently trying to pitch, which is ultimately you need the ragtag band to get this hyper specific job done. Like, it works, yeah. and, you know? and I think I think also it's it's acknowledging the science of both things. This is a biological creature from an extra dimensional space, mm-hmm. and the extra dimensional space where, where ghosts can be, but there's also biomatter in there. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm getting how it ties all together in in the canon. Now now I can be now that I can be super nerdy about it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you can also get sort of your Avengers Endgame time travel experimenting scenes where they're sort of comparing notes with their tech. So it's like the Ghostbusters have their trap technology and it's like, all right, we cut off this alien tentacle or whatever. Let's see if it goes in the trap and it actually grows and explodes and they're covered in slime. You know, just just really nice contained bits can come out of that. Well, like the MIBs could have like tel- teleporter technology. It's a big staple of science fiction so if they have some sort of teleporter and they're using it to go and in, interdimensionally or something you know what i'm saying they have some sort of piece of actual technology from sci-fi crap that could if tuned up right or or helped out by the plumbers be you know what i mean yeah, I get, and if, I get we, that. if we have the craft the some witches male or female doesn't really matter um and their goal is to literally bring you know, sort of like the Doctor Strange of it all, where they're trying to get power from this Cthulhu or, or, or whatever, and that's why they're bringing it out uh, if you actually decide to use the craft uh, as, like, a, a, a plot point. Because at this point, what like what is this Cthulhu coming to do? Who's bringing it? Why is this all happening type of thing? Or is it just a calamity like the the, the comet or meteor or whatever flying at the Earth? I, I also like witches as like a big set piece that maybe doesn't have to be the most linchpinny thing, but it like mm. shows like the type of world we're living in. Like, ah, oh, these four teenage girls did the right incantations and now all of a sudden tentacles are coming from another dimension and all this crap is happening. Somebody has to solve it. The different different teams show up. They have their differing like a way to show how this world works. That crap I mean, be something like that. That's kind of brilliant if your inciting incident is just like a bunch of teenagers who do a ritual and it just goes really, really bad. And now it's like, well, earth is going to be destroyed in 48 hours because this rift opened and nobody can close it. And it's just like, that's, that's how we got into this mess. That's kind of brilliant. Yeah. Who are you going to call at that point? Ghostbusters. I just had, I also, can I also just pitch a character out there? Um, I don't uh, This sort of transition us into talking cast, but Ron, when you said, which is male or female, my mind immediately goes to like, a hot, super emo male witch who's really, really dumb, but really, really hot. And the female Ghostbuster who is so annoyed by this person, but also really wants to bang them. I just feel like there's there's ripe comedy there uh, in that dynamic. I don't know. I mean, I'm down <laughs> sure. for it. All right, that sounds great. <laughs> that was awesome. You guys give me blank looks. Well, no, no, no. I thought I thought they did something like that in 2016. Is all like they I think did. he was like he was very so handsome, and then they were kind of lusting after him in a in a very trying to equal the scale sort of way for a while, and then he um, turned to be a, a demon or something. Well, you know what I mean? They, 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 the ghost that. inhibits his body, right. so he gets it back at the end. But yeah, mm. for like the third act, Chris Hemsworth is possessed by. 
whatever the guys. Is. And that is how we all learned. I never saw that 2016. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, all right. Well, can we talk? Let's start talking cast. I mean, we kind of have the broad arc of our plot, but how are our characters going to fit into this? And so I think there's a lot of big decisions to be made about how connected this is to any version of Ghostbusters or Men in Black. Um, I, you know, I don't know that we're going to be able to get Will Smith or Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, we can maybe get Emma Thompson playing the new Zed in Men in Black, but. I don't know. What do you guys think? Eh. Uh, no, like Tommy Lee Jones is retired by this point, I would assume in men in black lore. Uh, Will Smith. eh, I don't know if you need him. I don't think you need him. I think that it's weird to put him in this and then have him not be like the main guy. You you know what I mean? Like it's distracting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I say we get some random men in black. I'd say we a whole new cast. I think it's more or fun. Or you just find like some some really hot comedic actors right now or, you know, like I, I'm just throwing out a name. I'm not suggesting this, but it's just like if John Mulaney was one of your men in black agents or something, you know, like or whoever, Bo Burnham, whatever. Mm-hmm. Someone is is one of your men in black agents. So it's like someone that you kind of like you recognize and but it's okay that they're not like your main character, you know. You kidding me? John Mulaney and Tiffany Haddish as the two men in black. Well, oh, but uh, one thing I was also thinking is this too corny to put in there that like our main entree into both of these groups working together is I know that it's like all of them washed out. I don't know that that tracks for me, but I definitely know that there being a nice relationship between somebody who washed out of MIB and somebody who's firmly ensconced in Ghostbusters, but they used to be friends like before. I think Ooh. that's kind of interesting. There's something I like, like that. I mean, there's a good dynamic there. If they both try it, like got, you know, the tryout for the MIB and one of them got it and the other didn't like, right. You have a built in, like kind of mini conflict there, you know? Yeah. That's what, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 I like I that. I like great. that a lot. I think that's yeah. really good. I, I would also posit perhaps in this world due to his long career with the Ghostbusters, Winston Zeddemore became a higher up at MIB. Oh. Is there, does that I'm, track? I am super down with that. And also what? Zed. What? I mean, his last <laughs> name starts with Z already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I also think there's something there too. I mean, are we talking about having Ernie Hudson up in this piece? Yeah. Hey, this one. Go, go Hudson, to the fourth shot. I want to see everybody's face. <laughs> dude, yeah. Ernie Hudson is one of the greatest living actors. I swear to God, I made a list when I was in film school of actors I wanted to work with. Ernie Hudson was like one of five people on that list. I love Ernie Hudson. He's great okay. in everything. Everything. Yeah. Okay, so this is my thing. This is my thing. Why isn't Ernie Hudson the grand old man of the Ghostbusters company? And these new crop are crappy or so. I don't want to go to, you know, disco dance or break dance for the community center on it or two bad news bears, but this new crop, they're a bad batch. They're uh, the lower decks. They're whatever. And they just so happen to be in this giant. And like I said, they don't all have to suck or anything. I'm just saying like him being like the grand old man, the last dude to remember what it is because all these white boys retired just like in real life. They get a (laughs) bunch of money and then they go retire and be white somewhere by a lake and they leave it in the capable hands of somebody, sometimes from another country, sometimes some young person they grappled up. That's how a lot of these companies look at their CEOs, the ones that aren't the original person, that next batch is somebody that they hired on early on who got the business and they just leave them in their capable hands while they go jet ski. And I definitely think Winston going from a guy who just needed a job and was explaining stuff through Twinkies. And now he's the grand old man. I don't know, man, it's almost like the American dream, but it's crappy. I think there's a redemption arc in there though. If everything you just said is true, but he got recruited to run MIB and his opinion now is Man, Ghostbusters was like never anything that was going to last. Like I kept that shit going as long as I could, but you know, there's only so there's only so much you could do with no resources and no plan and no structure. And it's sort of like by the mm. grace of his good work, it still exists, but he moved on to bigger and better things. So now he is already going to have this sort of inbuilt predisposition of like 
Ghostbusters is trash. We don't need to be working with those guys for the exact reason that he mm. gave it all he could, couldn't get it past a certain place, and then he himself graduated beyond it. I think that could be kind of interesting. Hey, you sold me, Bill. I mean, I, I I like that, especially given the fact that like he him looking back on those dudes not upholding the traditions properly and stuff, and and by the end of it, obviously they're going to prove to prove to everybody that they really are good. But maybe they will need a little bit of his help. Maybe it would be great if you helped us instead of instead of you know what I mean. I mean, so, I like it all that. An arc uh, Avengers, uh, you know, style where they're building a team. I, I mean, you can't. It's that's that's a fantastic uh, uh, what B I guess B story to that is you know they're sure they're saving the world, but they also got to build a team to do it. So I mean, well, I love this idea that we're kind of setting up if we do the Ernie Hudson bit and then also the two friends. For, it's kind of like you tried out for cheerleading and you didn't make it. So now you're kind of like a color guard. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if I'd say anyone that was in color guard, uh, but uh, yeah, I do. I do think it was in color guard. I mean, <laughs> did she drive for to be a trailer? No, um, but I do. I do like the idea that the, that, that Ghostbusters is perceived as something lesser when really it's 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 just different and they have a different skill set and they are equally as great as what they do. It's just they're not on as big of a level. I think that's like if if we kind of keep playing that angle through the interpersonal relationships, I think we're on the right track. Yeah, totally agreed. I sort of feel like then, you know, if we go with the best friends, one gets into MIB and one washes out. Then we that washout who ends up getting recruited into Ghostbusters definitely needs to be the thing that changes the fortune of the Ghostbusters, right? It's it's essentially sort of a redemption arc for that character. He's, he's he or she gets a second chance to prove their metal, to prove that MIB effed up by turning them away, and then in so doing, also sort of redeems the Ghostbusters. I mean, it's a little bit the plot of Monsters University now that I think about it. You get turned away by the elite group and you go and join the dregs. But in so doing, you help the dregs prove that they're not the dregs, that they I mean, still have work. That's, that was the new Mighty Ducks TV show. That was literally exactly what it was like. It's a tried and true formula, but I don't think that makes it wrong. The fact that you can no. be like, oh, they did this here and here. That doesn't mean that it's the wrong way to go. You know, not at all. I also think that. Oh, no. No, oh, we're getting the call. Uh, we're getting the call. This should be. Uh, I wonder how many wines in she is. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> all right, here we go. Hello, boys. Good to see you all. Uh, what are we talking about? I forgot. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Ghostbusters. Oh, you're cute, Ghostbusters. I know we're talking about Ghostbusters. Come on. Listen, listen. I've been talking to some of my young development executives, and we think this whole movie should be shot as though it's a TikTok video. It's a, you know, it's like the found footage movie that they used to do, but it's TikTok because kids love TikTok. It'll be so revolutionary all the kids are gonna love it it's just the one point of view from tiktok the whole time and dance breaks because dance on tiktok gets the most clicks so dancing tiktok video it's the only way to go. It's the only way to go. You're all so silly. Okay, okay. I'll call back. You'll tell me how to do it. But just make it a dancing TikTok. Okay, goodbye. That's not that hard. <laughs> really? I feel like we just got queebied in 20 I seconds. Mean, like, I mean, you know, we it's, it's a documentary. Somebody's filming a documentary about the Ghostbusters or that they think the men in black are real, one of the other, and that they're they, that's how we get into it from that. And so you're, you're seeing it from that viewpoint the whole time, or at least some of the time. We can, of course do other things on you know on top of that but, but you can't i mean it, but it's tiktok it's it, it there's no tick 
documentary. Like it's 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 like she, the forty second clips. Well, yeah, but she wanted it from point of view, is what she said. Like someone's recording a, a, a TikTok video, and, and and if you're doing it from the point of view, like obviously we can't do one minute clips of an entire two hour movie. Could we? Could we do this? I know this isn't the mandate, but hear me out. Could we make a TikTok video? some sort of a MacGuffin. So we're constantly playing and referencing a TikTok video that maybe has like some sort of like embedded message in it. Or the fact that these kids that did this incantation at the beginning recorded it on TikTok. And the fact that it's spreading viral video mm. is what's making all well, these riffs. It's like, it's like what, if, what if the tape from the ring oh, was the TikTok video? Yeah. Exactly. Actually, yeah. Yeah. actually, if you guys are on TikTok, I don't know if you are or not, but I'm they not. do a challenge all the time. So people do challenges. So you've got to do whatever that person did on that video. So if you have kids all around the world doing the chant that they, that everybody else did, then that would create mm. some giant riff, which would be our disaster. Like by themselves, maybe it wasn't a disaster, but once it started trending around the world, uh, it, it became that's, a that's, that's awesome because what you could do is you could you could do that great I mean we know but you could do that great thing where you think you've squashed the villain at, in the first act and it's like but they don't realize that it's got the video's gone viral so it's like yeah we caught this thing one time but now it's been viewed 54 mm. billion times like we mm. can't stop 54 billion of these you know yeah, like the, the like in the the inciting incident, the person, one of the witches that dies or gets Cthulhu or whatever, pushes sin on that video, you know, and it becomes this cursed object. I, I think that's interesting because it also puts the inciting incident square in the hands of the MIBs and or the Ghostbusters, so that we can see, like I said earlier, how this world works through that, and the inciting incident actually makes things happen rather than just being a reference point. I also like the, I mean, yes to all that. I love the idea that like this thing goes viral on TikTok and all these teens start doing an actual demon summoning and there's just <laughs> demons busting loose all over the globe. Uh -huh. That's kind of amazing. Um, I was also thinking though, that like if Ghostbusters is sort of the struggling organization, which was always like their niche, right? The, the, the whole first movie and even the second movie is built on this idea that nobody takes these guys seriously and they're sort of struggling for a certain amount of legitimacy. I don't think it's beyond the pale that whoever your sort of Egon analog is, is trying to use TikTok to just get their cred up or, you know, or, or just advertise their services so it's um, like it could, sure you could tie those together though i think that's mm -hmm. how they discover how this thing has spread mm -hmm. is you know they're you know I, I love it too if it's they don't have to be old necessarily but if they're just like out of touch you know like look i'm, I'm i don't consider myself old and like i'm i know i'm too old for tiktok uh but it's just like if that's their you know if they really are befuddled how this why this is all happening that could be their well, yeah, the avenue of discovery, you know, and also like the young person that either that gets kicked out of the MIB or whatever could could either directly contribute to that or, you know, marshal them, recognize that one of them has a talent for that stuff. You know, what I'm saying? going real corny here, but I'm just saying like they have stuff hidden inside of them that could have helped everything. And last things last in the original movie, all this demonic activity, they became this hot hit. You know what I mean? A low down like VCR repairman. These guys are basically VCR repairmen. What if all of a sudden you needed VCR repairmen? All of a sudden, the last few that, that exist would be like, yeah, this is our time, baby. And, and you know what I mean? That, yeah. That's kind of the flavor of it. And MIBs are also so hidden. The, 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 the Ghostbusters, people like that who, who might know about them, know that they're big crap. But everybody else just thinks there's nothing and then stupid crap like the Ghostbusters. Then all of a sudden they become super relevant in this time. I, That's I also that. an interesting angle. And I don't know if it fits in this movie, but the idea that, you know, the Ghostbusters could be like, why do you guys hide? Like, you know, like we're available. So if people need us, they can find us. You guys hide and you think, you know, you just act when you think you know what's what time it is and you guys set the rules of what you think people can handle. Like there's something interesting to that too, you know? 
it's a great blue collar point of view, which the Ghostbusters always were supposed to have of like, you guys think you know better. We're just out here so people could find us because people know better. Like you don't know better up in your ivory tower with your <laughs> satellites. Screw you, government. I don't know. Not that it's that, but you know, you get my point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also one thing about like the MIBs, we got to tie them. I know where the Ghostbusters are kind of the good guys and the MIBs are kind of antagonists until they're not, but we got to tie something to the fact that like, it is this thing happened because of MIB crap, like not, not consulting people, not, not keeping up with the, with the ghost times, not taking ghost incursions seriously, things of this nature, because they've been hiding these aliens and giving them pop star jobs and stuff. You know what I mean? So, so what if, okay, this kind of ties back to what I was saying before, but like, what if at the beginning, this inciting incident, what if it's the MIB that shows up, this demon arrives from this incantation, the MIB shows up, neutralizes it right away, and they kind of take the body of this demon or whatever into their custody. They mind wipe everyone that's there. They do their thing. And it's like the fact that they thought that they knew how to handle this situation better, even though it's a demon and it's out of their realm of expertise. But the fact that they're like, we got this, we don't need to call in anybody. It's kind of that hubris uh, so that when it pops up everywhere, it's like if they had just consulted the Ghostbusters, maybe this never would have happened type of thing, you know? Totally. I'm, I'm uh, this is a little bit tangential, but as you guys are talking, my mind goes to, I don't know why I'm picturing like the current day Ghostbusters as essentially being like a family run electronics store. Maybe I'm just going back to Ed's VCR repairman thing. But if it's sort of like, you know, if, if Ray and Egon, I mean, Peter, well, I guess Peter did have a kid in continuity, but I'm just sort of thinking like if it's Ray's family and it's like a mom and a dad and a kid and the kid is almost like that dude, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, right? And it's like he's trying to revive, like that dude tried to revive his parents' wine business. The young kid is like trying to revive the parents' ghost busting business, even though the parents are like ready to throw in the towel. Anyway, I'm trying to get to like, how do they first encounter our main character who washes out of MIB and comes in to like turn the tide for them? Does that have something to do with this inciting incident of like the demon being summoned? Is it completely by chance? Is it, you know what I mean? Like just how do we get the band together in that way? Well, I, I would say we could just make them friends like, you know, you know, you have your best friend and then you have like the other people you hang out with and they, they could be the, one of them could be the other people you hang out with. Hmm. I mean, something as simple as that, then everybody's sort of linked. Is that too simple? I wonder if, I wonder if the main character is actually a ghostbuster when the, what if they're both Ghostbusters when the movie starts and they both quit and they both quit to join MIB and then ah. one guy shows back up and his mind is wiped and he doesn't remember doing it. But the other, like the other people, the other Ghostbusters that he's working with sort of like piece it together. I don't know what we get out of that. I'm just trying to think through the circumstances of how everybody gets together. Um, well, I mean, isn't I mean, it are we above, he, are, 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 just real quick, are we above a sequence that shows them being buddies, like stepbrother type friends together and always being in the same place and doing the same things, always together, always together, and then that split and how it rocks their worlds or rocks at least the, the loser's world and where they end up, and then we do the inciting incident? Are we above that? Are we above a weird summary of a relationship? Because All I'm saying is I love the fact that best buddies are in movies and jazz, but like it doesn't take too much to sell it. And if you do it properly is what I'm saying. And then we could kind of get to the meat of what happened when they split, like how their lives I mean, diverge. I can picture a scene where two kids are talking about aliens and ghosts and they're just having fun with the whole idea and sort of discover that there are some and then keep discovering that there are some all through their lives and then keep having to be erased over and over again, possibly. I don't know, something along those lines. Does, does that make any that, sense? Like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking 
kind of shows our, aptitude. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. Interesting. Well, like are are our heroes? All right, let me see if this makes sense. I'm just going to say it. So, if our heroes are part of the group that summons the demon, and then they get mind wiped and taken care of by MIB, like in the first or second scene. And then they go on living their lives without any knowledge of it. Um, I don't. I well. I guess then I don't know how they get roped back. Could they into have it. sort of a um, a Bucky Steve Rogers type relationship where uh, uh, you know our, our our Ghostbuster eventual Ghostbuster hero wants so badly to be in the Men in Black like his best friend Bucky for just this example, but he's too, for whatever reason, he just can't get into men in black, but he can join the ghostbusters, which is a joke. Uh, it's like, okay. Uh, and maybe, I mean, maybe like, that's kind of the go ahead. Yeah. The, well, the, I love that idea because the joke could be that there hasn't been ghosts for 20 years. So like you're going to do a job for somebody who doesn't even have anything happening. It's it's a pretend job, you know, and yeah, and I think that's and, what it, it it has to. I mean, that's, it, we're just we're we're kind of going in circles a little bit, but it kind of has to be like, yeah, if if today you told me I'm going to school to learn how to repair VCRs and sell pagers, I'd be like, okay, I guess if that's is it good to have a job? I guess you know, like I do think that though that you know I can just see that relationship, you know starting like with the the bucky and skinny steve rogers yeah and, and, I think I, and um, no go ahead go ahead i know i was just gonna say i think you're right on with that billy the, the only thing i'm trying to figure out is like because the mib is so secretive and covers their tracks so well how do you get to the point where it's like you're jonesing to join them um or even but, specifically you know a person who has joined right them. well they i mean look I I'm hate to use this as an example because it was a terrible movie, but like men in black international, that's exactly what Tessa Thompson's character was. She knew mm. that men in black existed because she avoided getting mind wiped. So she saw them and she knew she wanted to be them. And one of the reasons they even like gave her a shot was because she tracked them down. But in our world, Who's to say that maybe, you know, this takes away another plot point that we were talking about with the men in black being far superior in terms of, you know, why don't you show yourselves? But it's like, all right, let's abandon that for a second. Just say, yeah, what if after the events of men in black three or men in black international, whatever men in black have gone public and people know that they exist and they appreciate that the men in black are there to protect them from threats that are otherwise considered extra dimensional. So the, the fact that you now have this, like the men in black are like a known thing. The ghostbusters just seems really, really pathetic in comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't mind that at all. Actually, they're just sort of like disclosure happened you know, five years before the events of our movie. So we're just living in a world where the men in black are known and accepted. And even like the existence of aliens is known and accepted. Right. In a weird way. If you're in a world where the existence of aliens is like acknowledged and accepted, the existence of ghosts almost seems more stupid. Right. Because it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, exactly. like, it, that's clearly not the thing. We've got all these aliens. That's the thing. There's no right. ghosts. Right. Yeah. I mean, when it shows exactly. up with tentacles and looking like an alien, sending in the men in black to take care of it makes sense. Yeah. Is that what you were going to say, Ed? No. I'm, I'm just, well, I mean, like Billy said, we did a little reiterate or chase our tail for a second. But yeah, that's what I was meaning by it being such inferior technology and them having to kind of catch on again. Because, but, but I didn't, I did not anticipate you guys bringing the MIBs public. And part of me like super rejects that. And I think MIB fans will reject, reject that, but they rejected a faithful movie. So who yeah. cares what they think? <laughs> so I love the fact that they're public. I love I mean, that. yeah, graduate them to the like, 
Maybe, yeah. you know, something happened in 2025 mm-hmm. and it was like, we can't mind wipe the world. It's just right. out here. It happened. I it. And but I love that idea. Underdogs. Yeah. Ima- yeah. Imagine if the MIB are kind of like how kids used to look up to astronauts in the 60s, you know, like yeah. mm-hmm. uh, they are they are they are airline pilots. They are celebrities, mm-hmm. you yep. know, and why and do then you we not have- want to join them? Yeah, mm-hmm. and then we can have the kids growing up wanting to be that, and then the one kid also talking about ghosts the whole time. Well, it's just like, well. imagine, I imagine it, it's like, you know, in high school, you had some of those kids that were like an ROTC, you're in Men in Black TC, you know? Like, yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a bunch of kids in your high school with full suits and stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Because just to bring it full circle with the original Ghostbusters, they are in college, and they are studying xenobiology they're studying extraterrestrials because it's now an accepted science Mm -hmm. because the men in black are public and so they're both studying to join the men in black right and the problem is only one of them gets in and the other guy is now on his ass postgraduate no job in debt where is he going to go with everything he just learned ghostbusters is one of the only good choices Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like that's why he shows up at the door because it's like well I could either go back to school and be a teacher's assistant and make like 20 grand a year. And I wanted to be in the action or I could go to this washed up unit that maybe gets action. I don't Maybe he even has an ulterior motive for joining the ghostbusters. I don't know, but Which I just love the idea of they're coming straight out of college and like right. one guy goes, one guy doesn't. But then you get that really fun comedy moment of like his first ghost bust. He goes and it's essentially like getting a cat out of a tree. Like this is the lamest ghost bust, you know, like we have to set up like it's not how dangerous. irrelevant the Ghostbusters are. Literally it's just a ghost floating there doing nothing. And they're like, we got to get rid of this ghost. And it's like, but Okay. Well, I just, I just think part of it is we. It we, doesn't we, resist. It's kind of happy. I'm sorry. Well, no, no, no I, I just think the graduation of those ideas is this: Ghostbuster training is both. Hey, here's how to get an old lady to give you 400 bucks for a consultation for a <laughs> creaky door, but also there might be an ectoplasmic entity there. We'll give you some tools to suss it out and grab it so it doesn't kill you and slit her and slit the, his throat and run out into the streets. We'll do. We'll give you that training too. We you, we got to train you for both because our I business mean, model needs both. A hundred percent. I think you. I think in this world, Ghostbusters are treated like psychics. Where yes. It's like, okay. Yes. Sure. Yes. You know? And there's always enough business for psychics. Those fools with the conjuring crap. Those <laughs> fools coasted on that jazz for twenty years. I think they saw two ghosts, but they told twenty books. I mean, Miss so, Cleo you know, <laughs> made her whole living before I think she was arrested. I'm not sure. But uh, other yeah. than you know, it's like. They only, I love that idea of even if the Ghostbuster starts is a little bit like shady in a sense. It's like, look, you know, if, if there's nothing there, you still, you know, kick the, kick the door with your foot when they're not looking and take the, take the down payment and get out, you know? Okay. Wait. So here's, here's an idea too. If, you know, at minute 20, so all this happens, we establish the world. This guy's working for the Ghostbusters. They're kind of hucksters, love all of that. So then minute 20, minute 25, our inciting incident happens. And this TikTok video of someone summoning a demon goes viral. And the Ghostbusters go to check it out. Maybe on the, at the urging of our hero, because he's like, guys, we got to go check this out. And they go, and nobody there remembers it happening. And the weird thing about that is that men in, MIB is essentially outlawed neuralizer technology. Ever since going public, and this is also how you get out some some. Pope in the pool style exposition, right? Ever since going public, they don't use neuralizers anymore. It was, you know, they were declared illegal once disclosure happened, but the Ghostbusters show up and nobody involved with the demon summoning remembers what happened. And it's a red flag of like, are the MIB using neuralizers again? And the reason they're using neuralizers again is because this is a problem that they don't know how to solve and is totally off their radar. And so the Ghostbusters go and have to, they try to investigate the MIB because they smell something fishy. And in so doing, they realize like, oh, you guys need us, even though the MIB is like, we don't need you. Yeah. But of course they do because the whole thing is demonic. Right. Um this might be too complicated, but I'm now I'm thinking with everything you just said, could it be 
and maybe this is what causes friction is the men in black are like, no, we don't neuralize. I don't know what you're talking about, but you guys are Bush league. You shouldn't even be here. Why don't you leave the real business? And it turns out that really our main antagonist, our bad guy is a men in black agent who is trying to summon these dark world things for, I don't know. We can come up with a reason why he would, but it's like he has this, Sure. Yeah. What? Who? Who's more dangerous than a possessed men in black agent? You know, right? I mean, that's kind of interesting. Think about so. So the incident happens. It goes out on TikTok, which I still think we 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 can't lean away from the idea that like this goes out on TikTok, and then when it goes out on TikTok, it starts happening all over the world. And so we need to come up with like a solution for that. That mm-hmm. might be the last big heavy lifting for the plot. Like, how do we undo that? But I do think there's something interesting that like, okay, two men in black agents respond immediately. They think that they take care of the whole situation, but one MIB agent gets possessed. And so now you have a demon on the inside and maybe he even allows the TikTok to go, but like nobody caught this, right? And Winston Zedemore, who's running MIB is so pissed. Like, how do we not catch this TikTok? Now it's out there. There's no way to undo it. And it's all part of this master plan that this demon inside the MIB agent has. I don't know. Does that work? I think that's yeah. kind of fun. It makes it gives us like one central antagonist to kind of at least hang our hat on, you know, the Edgar of the movie. And I have yeah. a, I mean, a ridiculously terrible yet purely entertaining, maybe to me, ending where to to do to undo it, you have to do another like anti summoning or banishment tiktok that you have go viral i mean we do have to put dance breaks in this i was just gonna say i was gonna say and it has to involve a dance thing yeah i was gonna be the will smith men in black let me see you just bounce it with can we just do that all (laughs) routine (laughs) oh dude yeah you gotta you gotta perfectly it's it's the mib challenge right so you have to perfectly recreate the will smith dance routine for the that's literally perfect dude and That's it, literally perfect. It's so yeah. dumb, but hopefully by that point you've already enjoyed the movie enough that you're like, all right. Well, so, so a whole bunch of people just have to like, come on, grandma, we want these demons gone, don't you? And she's like, That's with me. That's with me. I was gonna I was gonna make a suggestion that we somehow combine MIB neuralizer technology with Ghostbusters trap technology to to essentially make the demons forget that they're demons and then walk into the trap or go back through a portal. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's something kind of interesting about combining tech. It's not quite as cool as everyone doing the men in black dance, (laughs) but (laughs) it probably is a little more satisfying. Um, I just, we do have to like, like pause, like hard pause for a second and figure out like, what is, what does that even mean? We have to put dance breaks in this. Like, what do you do? Well, I mean, so, if people are possessed or ghosts, I just, or coming, I just, I just or, think it's part and parcel. Coming. I just think it's part and parcel with TikTok, and I do believe that somebody doing a summoning by t- twerking a certain way while <laughs> holding a yeah. freaking thing while this, while that—that's the new age of this crap. Holy it's the great. Oh, you're asking some demons. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, a minute. guys, that is what it is. It's not that. It's not that they're witches intentionally summoning anything. It's just some chick doing a twerk or doing shuffling or whatever, and the combination of her movements just opens a hell mouth. And so it becomes like, your dance is so fire, it's hellfire. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, people, like, I'm just saying, like, taking into account, you know, it's always Victorian, right? Well, what mm-hmm. did they do before the Victorians? And what did they do before that? The Stonehenge stuff isn't exactly like what they were doing in Victorian times, just summon stuff. So it's like, it always has to graduate. This is the new form. I can already see the Screen Rant article. New Ghostbusters takes right-wing conservative view. It's like (laughs) (laughs) sexy dancing equals end of the world. I'm not saying it's just twerking. I'm talking about all types of stuff. You got got, uh, whatever is the politically correct thing for a dream catcher, or maybe it's not politically correct to even do that, but some weird symbol like that. That taken out of context, some goofy, uh, tr- basically t- I mean, tribal dance taken out of context. It's just all right. of the that is interesting. Look, of you our could, time, the, <laughs> these teens. I mean, let's make them white girls that 
culturally appropriate some sort of dance that they should not be doing, but they think that it fits to the beat of this song, you know? And then one and one of them are a couple awesome. of, yeah, and a couple of them are witches, and they're just like let's combine to, to this new style, and that breaks the dimensional wall. It's it's just not you know, if they take a witch dance because yeah, oh, that, I mean, I don't think they're witches, probably. dude. No, but I'm saying I, mean, I don't they, think they're witches. This no, is I don't think they are. I think I think they take this dance that they have no business. They don't know what it is, but they appropriate it, and then the world just goes to crap. I get it. I don't really care. It's 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 cool that they cause this problem by something so innocuous, and that's that. So that being the case, though, yeah, that pushing everything forward, and then having there have to be <laughs> some stupid uh, TikTok re- resolution to this, whether it's a dance or whether it's a neuralizer pulse. What if the TikTok? <laughs> was, this may be. This is a little bit like just a yes and your earlier idea, Bill. Uh, Bill, um, what <laughs> if you? What if the TikTok? is like a neuralizer flash and it's sent out through TikTok. Like the neuralizer flash is what's going viral again. I don't mind that. I mean, it's, it, it kind of gets back to that question of like, all right, once the demons are summoned, what are they doing? You know, and like Gozer the Gozerian at the end of the original Ghostbusters was essentially trying to like merge her dimension with our dimension and it was going to be an apocalypse scenario. So like, what are these demons trying to achieve or accomplish, if anything? I just feel uh, like Ragnarok. I, you know, yeah. just, I was gonna say, in this case, it doesn't really. I this is one of those few times where I don't care what the bad guy's doing. Like honestly, I don't think it makes a difference. They're coming to e- eat just us. Just hell on earth, care. you know. Yeah. And but also, it just goes back to the to the Ghostbusters of it all. Let us never lose sight. The demons came to eat hot dogs and stack books. Okay, That's let's fair. relax. So, break the de- so, so there are fissures between the realities, and demon creatures are coming through, and they're doing all manner of mischief. And some of it is quite dangerous. Some of it is deadly. Some of it's super scary. Some of it's super uh, just annoying. You know what I mean? So we can have these scenes and have this have this fun. Have, we got to have some promise of the premise up in here. All right, so let's start talking cast because I think that'll also solidify some of our ideas about, you know, who these characters are. I think we've got a, a nice array of characters. So at the very at the bare minimum, we need, you know, the MIB agent best friend uh, with the Ghostbuster best friend. We need an MIB partner. So probably and we need an evil MIB agent who might even be the partner of, you know, part of our uh, duo. And then we need more Ghostbusters. So can we think casting, starting with wherever you want to start it? I mean, maybe it's even fun to start talking about who the evil MIB agent should be. Um, (laughs) Cats everywhere. Wow. Ron and cats living together. Mass hysteria. (laughs) Okay. Also, can I kind of just one, one quibble I had with this whole possessed jazz? I, I think every single part of Ghostbusters was always the guy, the people, the people that summon these things know what they're, somebody knows what they're doing. I think there is a giant twist in somebody in the MMI, MIB knowing anything about this and try to take advantage of this situation in a way that you wouldn't expect the MIB to do would be great. But I just the 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 the, the non agency of just being like oh, I have been summoned and all this jazz. I just think there's got to be a, the, if we're gonna do that, the scene has to be hilarious. Like he, how he gets Rick Moranist into this monster thing that can still go to work and do his job with all this access. You know what I mean? Or like the MIB scene with a uh, Vincent D'Onofrio being taken over by the bug from the inside. There has to be some meat to it. it just, he just can't be stumbling around in a daze. And sometimes when he looks in the bathroom mirror, they're red or something. I just I don't like okay. I don't like that. But I'm mean, saying that, hold on, Ron, sh- like, b- b- before ahead. we go there, I, I think you just kind of answered your own concern. I mean, in the original Ghostbusters, all the antagonists were possessed people. It was Rick Moranis and Sigourney Weaver being possessed. And in the original MIB, it's essentially a possessed guy, the Edgar suit. So to that point, we just need to pick a really great physical actor who can mm-hmm. give as memorable a performance as possessed Rick Moranis, possessed Sigourney Weaver, or possessed Vincent D'Onofrio. Mm-hmm. So that's the task here. That's why I want to get into casting, because that's really where we're going to sell this. So who's for that person? Besides Nick Vincent, Cage. Vincent, oh, Jesus, we're going to put Nick Cage in the swear. I got a weird one. I swear one. to God. 
uh, Jim Carrey. I mean, I know he's a maniac, but he is great at physical comedy. Yeah, I feel like that's the wrong type of comedy, though. I mean, you think about you think about Sigourney Weaver and Vincent D'Onofrio. Those are amazing actors, actors, I would even go as far to say. And so I, I do think you want somebody who can bring gravitas as well as bizarre physical presence. And I think that Jim Carrey is just too much of a rubber face. Like you just don't take him seriously. Hmm. Oh yeah. And he does have to do a bunch of serious stuff through the whole movie. I still think he could do it, but you know, that's fine. He has to be menacing. And every time that Jim Carrey has done menacing, like number 23, like it's like, it's just bad. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Hmm. Um, He's just just better as a joke character. You know what I mean? Jim Carrey. Um, Hmm. But somebody smooth that could be in the MIB too, though. Like they're a good yeah. actor, but they're a smooth, cause, cause they're supposed to be look. They're supposed to look like quarterbacks. Okay. It, this might be a swear jar suggestion, but Tom Hardy would absolutely murder that. You essentially start him as a James Bond type and he slowly devolves into even weirder than his venom character. Like is that, that would possible? be possible. Is there anything well, left after that venom? <laughs> <laughs> All I know is Tom Hardy is probably the greatest working actor. So he would, he would make a meal out of that. Yeah. I, I mean, if, if he's not too typecast by it, then that's it's a good star too. That's the right choice. Yeah. It's a good star name. Could also be funny to, to do someone like Nick Offerman who can 100% sell kind of the bureaucratic hard ass, but I would love to see what he could do with like a weird, I'm possessed by a demon sort of turn. That's really interesting. And he could bring the comedic parts and make them seem natural on top of bringing the, the interesting bureaucratic sort of point of view to it. Um, I mean, essentially if, yeah, if it, if Nick Offerman starts playing the Tommy Lee Jones character more or less, but then turns slowly turns into a demonic maniac, I think he would, I think he'd do really well with that. What age range are we looking for? Or is it not necessarily? Uh, personally, I think, I think that the guy who turns over needs to have an, a, an authority position. So I like, I like Nick Offerman's age and that. Regard. I was just going to say like, he may be too past this point in his career, but Michael Keaton's another one that can be stone cold serious mm. and he can get real weird. Uh, mm. If you want you to get nuts, let's, let's get, get nuts. nuts. <laughs> I mean, imagine if he was Batman and Beetlejuice in the same movie, you know, <laughs> Seriously, uh, you know, what, bro? I think as much as I was leaning for the offer, okay. Offerman gets a, he, he gets the, the call. He missed the call. I, li- I like, uh, <laughs> I, I like, be trivia. Nick Offerman's <laughs> agent didn't give him the call in time. <laughs> I'm down with Keaton. No, Michael Keaton would be great. All right, I do think we should go younger with the two best friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is a possibility, you know, they could also have a romantic entanglement, and that could be sort of a runner through this. You know, I, I don't know. I, I do think that the Vankman um, Sigourney Weaver romance was such a big part of the original Ghostbusters. And I do think that on our show, we tend to shy away from romances for whatever reason, but I feel like this one could actually be enhanced by having, like, if this is more than a platonic friendship, if this is, you know, they have a, a moonlighting Sam and Diane sort of dynamic, like a will they, won't they, and the space between them is only exacerbated by one joining the MIB and one washing out. You know, it could even be that the one who joins the MIB maybe finds a, a, a better potential partner, romantic partner in MIB, and you got to win them back. I don't know. I just, there's something fun to that. It's a classic 
cinematic setup. I mean, I, I like it because it harkens, maybe this will ruin it for some people, but it harkens back to the uh, Starship Troopers, where it's like you join the military for a girl, and then she gets put to, to some whole other unit that goes some other place and finds a way cooler guy that, than you that does more what she wants to do, and you're just left there holding the bag and eaten by bugs on a, on a <laughs> planet. You know, I, I love all that, so like that that's good, and I think the lady should go to the MIB to me. I think, yeah, I think that's my you know, instinct, too. That's 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 just my contribution to that. I mean, we could we could also, you know, just go full on 2021 with this and it could be two ladies and they have a they just have a they're just lesbians and that doesn't matter to the plot. They just are. Um, I'm cool with that. We did talk about they just graduate college. Right. So if they're study buddies and they're up late together in the library and they both have these hopes and dreams and they're supporting each other as they're chasing their dreams. And it's like the romance feels inevitable. And maybe it's like the guy or the girl, one of them is just waiting until they graduate to save up enough money to make their move or whatever. And then they're separated by fate and circumstance. Oh, my heartstrings are being tugged even as I speak. Come oh, on. and and as the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest wrinkle to add to yes and all that, the guy fails the psyche vowel because he believes in ghosts. And when you go into the MIB, they want you to accept one mumbo jumbo. We can't have agents out there shooting at ghosts, shooting at aliens, shooting at Sasquatches. No, one mumbo gumbo. You believe in aliens? You're in. You know what I mean? Oh. Dude, and then she gives him that withering look because in the first five minutes of the movie, they had the conversation where she tries to correct him. Like, we know that ghosts don't exist. It was proven as when disclosure happened or whatever, that those were all aliens. Like, you can't, you know, if you say that stuff, they're going to kick you out. And he's like, no, no, like they want free thinkers. And then it happens. And as the door closes, he gives her the Michael, she gives him the Michael Corleone look. Through the door, through the closing door, like you just had to say it, didn't you? You screwed yourself. Oh, I see it all happening. I see it, dude. Right? And so yes. when the stuff comes back, and we got the montage of the little kids running behind the bike like Rocky. Look, those are Ghostbusters. He's got to be like, yeah. You know what I mean? Love it. <laughs> all right. So who are those people? If uh, we have uh, this, we have this maybe. grand character dynamic. Well, a precise woman. And I'm not saying that they're they're not plentiful. I'm saying uh, that's the quality that we I think we should approach. You know what I'm saying? Like almost like a little severe and like needs to have more fun or some jazz, but not pretty and doesn't know it or any of that dumb crap. But just like about, a real go getter, a girl quarterback. How about Selena Gomez? Is that too ridiculous? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yes. <laughs> Selena you Gomez know what I'm saying? Is not that character. Like, like um, if Scully was fresh out of the academy, like who is that archetype for right now? Like precise I mean, quarterback <sighs> girl. I'm doing nothing but swear jar suggestions this episode. <laughs> but Mackenzie Davis, dude, the the tall blonde chick from Halt and Catch Fire and Terminator Dark Fate. Who oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is just. She is gorgeous and super capable and an amazing actress and can play smart, but can also play cold. Like she is a female quarterback. I don't know. I love her. I think she's great, but I also think that she is perfect for that role. Open to other suggestions. I mean, the first name that came to my head, and I don't know if it's too young now, but was Haley Steinfeld. I think she definitely has the acting chops and I can see her playing a little bit more, serious but has the ability to kind of soften up but i don't know if that's too young she's also going to be hot commodity like she already is but coming off a of hawkeye, hawkeye you know yeah hmm. no, that's interesting uh she's 24 i don't think that's too young no i mean i think you you just want somebody who can play either fresh out of college or fresh out of grad school i think anybody in their 20s can would work even into early thirties, if they have a youthful, you know, Hollywood face. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think Haley Steinfeld is too young at all. Yeah. I like that. I'm trying to think. Well, I mean, in addition to continuing to think about who uh, the woman might be, who would be the guy then who's the guy who holds that torch, washes out, ends up with the ghostbusters. Um, same age range. Uh, I'll throw out a swear jar name. Uh, 
the one that also was running through my head when you're talking about all this was John Boyega. I think John Boyega mm-hmm. is definitely someone who he, he could play younger. I think he could play younger, but also just like he can carry a movie. He we've seen him do it before. Uh, yeah. I I think he needs he needs to really stretch his wings in a good franchise movie. Uh, but I could definitely I could see him suiting up in the classic suit. I see it. Yeah, I love that idea. I'm down with John Boyega. Yeah, I don't mind that at, at one. And point. Haley Steinfeld. Yeah, John Boyega, so Haley Steinfeld. Um, I wonder if I don't know. Just I'm 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 hanging on the the female casting. Um, just to, for other options, what about Shailene Woodley, who we haven't heard from much lately, but I think could also sort of play that very self possessed. I just don't like her. I, I don't have a reason. I don't have a reason. Was she in? I don't know her. She's not, a, she's not even a bad actress. Um, she was the lead in all the Divergent movies, if that uh, okay. tracks for you, Ron. I don't know. Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, and she married to like Aaron Rodgers or something? Yes. As of recently, married to Aaron Rodgers. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't have very much to contribute to this. I think a young. I would. I would want to put a young uh, Asian woman in the room. I'd want to put a uh, maybe if we could find somebody besides Selena Gomez, uh, somebody that that seems smart and like a Scully. But I do. I do like Mackenzie. I'll, I'll always stand for her. I'm, I'm me and Bill are much simpatico in that regard. But just like, uh, yeah. Uh, just young actresses that aren't swear jars aren't coming to me right now. Uh, and I love the John Boyega casting because I want him to speak with his regular English accent. I think that'd be funny. <laughs> and he's with these plumbers and he's like classing up the joint with this, like, well, you know, you should do and You know, all this. I love, I love all that. No, I think that makes sense too. Like if he's, I mean, that could also be part of his character arc if he is on a student visa and it's like, I just need to get a job after college mm. and he doesn't get the MIB job. That's a great reason to just go ahead and take that Ghostbusters gig. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's that. a safety school. It's, it's me safety school. I love it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, do we have any suggestions for other Ghostbusters? Like, is there an older person in the Ghostbusters? Maybe that's our Nick Offerman role. Is there, you know, I still how many Ghost- Ghostbusters are there? There's like between four and five, right? Well, I mean, I, traditionally there's four, but it, we could be whatever we want it to be. I like the idea of like varying wildly in ages. Like I like agree. Like, like I, three, I want- like two nor like normal. Sorry, two like thirty. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, how we about Randall Park? From outer space. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Two, uh, 30 ish, 20, 30. But then like, I don't know. I don't know why I had in my head. Like I can just see Mark Hamill in a freaking Ghostbusters oh. suit. Dude, and I just I, feel like he's just like the whatever, you know, I was going to say <laughs> Randall Park, but like Mark Hamill. Oh, that's interesting. I, yeah. I'm kind of, I don't know why I'm just really stuck on this idea that other than the John Boyega character, the Ghostbusters are all family members that like, it's just devolved into like one family is trying to keep ghost busting afloat. Well, I, think I, if you do that, uh, I was just going to say, if you do that, then like, I don't know, there's like this, there's this, almost obligation and i feel like the audience is going to expect that they are somehow related to at least one of those four original ghostbusters if you and, do and that. then on top of that you're also adding in an extra story element that we would have to talk about in some way wouldn't we i, I don't think it, i actually think it simplifies it because rather than just having a, a random collection of what are essentially going to be supporting characters. Cause they, we don't have enough time for them all to get their own stories. Just having them be a family shortcuts, all of that. There's the one member who's really in like, this is our obligation to keep it going. There's the one child character who's only there out of obligation and hates being there. There's maybe a younger child character who's a prodigy, who's a genius technologically, but doesn't really know anything about keeping the business running. And then their, their interpersonal dynamic is all shorthand because they're related. I, I feel like that solves more problems than it creates personally. 
Well, then I've got three cast members. Mark Hamill, Daisy Ridley, and you know it, Tom Holland. I got it. The Tom okay, Holland one isn't serious, by the way. But Mark Daisy Hamill, Ridley, Daisy Ridley, I, I'm serious. genuinely okay with that. I am but, serious uh, about those two. Obviously, the Tom Holland is slightly a joke. Uh, my 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 only my only pushback on that is the relationship to me that simplified is these are losers at a dead end job that sucks, and this is what they have. So you can have one that's Nick Offerman's age. You can have Randall Park as a guy who thinks he's bad. Nick Offerman is like, yo, I just, hey, it's a job. I just show up and I do stuff. And most of the time we don't have to do anything. And Randall Park thinks he's better than it. He thinks he could be anything he wants to be. And then uh, uh, another character is whatever. But the bottom line is John Boyega comes in as a really smart person who knows his stuff into this pool of losers. And there's instantly like some sort of dynamic and last things last when Ernie Hudson sold off the company to whatever type of idiot who would want to keep that enterprise alive after 1987. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, I just think that there's something to the corporate McDonald's aspect of it. Like, you know what I mean? Somebody like, like what we're doing with these stupid franchises. We're like going through the trash cans, trying to, you know, get the dirt off of these things. Somebody would do that with the ghostbusters concept. They're still blockbusters for Christ's sake. That's all I'm saying. I, I think it'd be the corporate culture would be enough of a family for me to be funny and lampoon for my taste is all I'm saying. I, that's fair. Um, I do think it might behoove us to not be obligated to any other connections to the original beyond just the Winston role. So yeah. it, it might be good if it's like there is no Vankman, Spangler or Stance because they're going to lean on that heavily in this one that has already bombed, according to our slurring siren. Uh, <laughs> so you know what I mean. So I think that, you know they're going to lean on that. They're going to lean on, oh, that's the that's the Reitman blood in your kid. Choo choo choo, shoot the stuff. They're going to lean into the the, the Ghostbusters are going to have midichlorians by the end of that damn movie. They're going to lean mm. so hard on the family lineage part. You know what I mean? Mm. So just just getting away from that and having it be like a crappy corporation versus the government backed apex of all life. It's just almost block versus uh, the SETI and and the and the and all that. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Ed. I kind of think like not making it a family and having like just a band of merry misfits makes it hit a little harder because. There's kind of a, you know, we all hit this dead end as opposed to we're family. Like, there's still, like, a good bond there, whereas these guys, like, the only thing they have in common is, like, they all kind of struck out at whatever they were going to do, you know? It's like the worst telemarketing office <laughs> in the whole world. I, I mean, don't know if anybody's it, ever done telemarketing, it. but, like, it is just this crazy misfits who are like, I can sell stuff. So I'm here, but it's not like a good telemarketing place. It's like you're selling warranties to, to old people. Like you're, you're selling ink cartridges to companies, you know, it's like, but it's ghosts instead. Like, but just on a practical it, level, it allows us to have a wider depth yeah. of casting. Like we could yeah. throw some really odd nets. You could have we could Mark have Hamill, right Danny Trejo and Daryl from the office. And it makes sense if they're all there on their yeah. own accord, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. Cause like, I just thinking about all of what you guys just said, I sort of would love to have Melissa McCarthy, Leslie Jones, or Kate McKinnon <laughs> in one of those roles. But again, I just don't know that we want to explicitly connect it to any of the old movies. Um, I like yeah. all of those people. So that's like, I would be super glad to have them in anything, but you're already setting yourself up for, oh, they're just redoing it again. But like, I don't care about those people. <laughs> lame, lame, man, no, lame, I guess, lame I guess people more, I don't care about. I guess all of those people, especially Leslie Jones and Melissa McCarthy, I think are just great in terms of being like dry working class. I'm so over this BS type of humor um, while also being women, which I think we, we would do well to try to keep a pretty mm. even split. Right. Like it'd be it'd be great if John Boyega comes into a situation where it is two men, two women, or one man, two women, or you know one man, two women plus an old Mark Hamill who's just hanging around being their Janine, you know, 
Uh, yeah. that's, that's all I guess I'm trying to get to. Well, Leslie, mm. I could see Leslie Jones being the person who's like teaching them, who's like in charge of the sales, basically. Like she's the one who's like, yeah, you got to do this to get the sale sometimes. Just, Look, I, yeah. I, I say this as someone who prefers the 2016 one to the originals. I think this is a bad idea. I think, okay. I, th- I think just from a marketing standpoint, if you're like, we're making a Ghostbusters and it's a sequel to the one that you guys had a meltdown over, I just, you're not going to be able to sell it, especially too, because that one, again, even though I like that one more, it was a box office disappointment. Like, man, and, uh, so, and also to I me, mean, the task is to take it out of the cold, dead hands of this, this, the, the, the Reitman family, for lack of a better word. I'm not trying sure to be ass about that, but like, this is a property that is owned by a major corporation. It is not some family's little heirloom, the Ghostbusters property, nor the actual and fictional Ghostbusters business. None of that belongs to anybody like that. It is, like in real life, been passed around to people who don't care about it. And we find it in a state of disrepair. And at the end of this damn movie, it will have been repaired because everybody will know that these guys are important. So, so who, who's in those roles? That's, that's the question. So, so I mean, like, and, and who's funny? Because this is a comedy. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, most I want Lady talented. Gaga to be one of them. Honestly, I want Lady yeah. Gaga to be one of I'm them. I'm totally okay. on board I, with that. I think that'd be 100%. so awesome. She's like this art school kid who like knows about seances and knows about all the stuff, and maybe uh, is one of the ones that knows about the notices the thing on TikTok or something. She's really with it, you know. But and she's strange, gal. I love. I that. thought you were thinking that it was going to be Lady Gaga playing into the fact that she's also just like an Italian girl for, I guess she's technically, I think from Detroit originally, but just Lady Gaga takes all the artsy fartsy b- bullshit off and it's just i'm stephanie jamada you know what i mean like <laughs> hey uh, is that character a, a wonderful combination of that i think when somebody said the worst thing you could have called her in an art school was was normal or boring you know what i mean and so yeah she's maybe trying to fight that but she's like like joan cusack and the woke, working girl like yeah i got all these ideas about churrascuro lighting and nobody like listens to her because she sounds like that you know what i mean <laughs> Because like, I think everybody, everybody, and most of the people, Ron hit it on the head earlier about the telemarketing. I know we're wrapping up here, but like telemarketing businesses have geniuses in there because it's a genius art to get somebody to give you their social security number four minutes after you got them on the phone. I don't care if they're an old lady or a young person. It's a it's a genius task, but it's also you can't do anything else because you're a loser. So there's like I love that these particular type of they could be winners in another timeline. And it just takes Boyega to try to tie them together to make them a good team. Okay, you know who actually has been lighting the internet up on fire with memes over the weekend that I actually think could be... uh, This would probably be in lieu of Mark Hamill because you wouldn't want two of these. Mm. I would put Matt LeBlanc in there because everyone is just (laughs) loving Matt LeBlanc and his new kind of dad bod from the Friends reunion. He, We know he's funny. I would put him in there as kind of like the old college quarterback that keeps reliving the glory days and you know he Dude, thinks yeah. that he is yeah. a young buck you know yeah, and he I, certainly yeah. couldn't make men in black anymore you know <laughs> well just I, like, I, I caught a four-headed malbolgia in yeah. 1994 <laughs> it was crazy bro he's coasted <laughs> off his old victories uh yeah i and definitely he, has he, that like police versus fireman mentality with the men in black <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. a true <laughs> believer that's what I'm trying to say. That's why that's why I fought so hard for them to be misfits and all this kind of jazz. Because like th- some of them are true believers. You will find people in a call center or any sort of stupid dead end job that are true believers. Because if they shed that, they're just losers sitting amongst other losers. But already, and that like, can't be. John Boyega, Gaga, Matt LeBlanc. This already sounds like this is the weirdest, craziest. I got to see how these guys interact. So yeah, if you get one more. In that vein, like I kind of think that's <laughs> please cool. make it somebody younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there's got to be some young blood on the team that could. I mean, I don't want to be <sighs> some young person that could maybe be somebody that Boyega sees as a possible person to be with uh, since he's gotten away from. You know what I mean? So there could be some dynamic tension. Like I don't like dudes who pine for half a movie about a chick. That's wiggity yeah. whack. I don't want to, John Boyega. We ain't gonna make John Boyega a simp again. That hey, ain't gonna wanna, happen on my you make, watch. You want to make a <laughs> bunch of people I know super happy? You really do put Daisy Ridley in there, and then they kiss at the f-ing end. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> you know what I would you know what I would trade? I would trade five kisses for one accurate use of a lightsaber. <laughs> but anyway. oh, don't start this conversation. It's gonna just We're not doing not this end one. well. I was mean, just getting that last dig in. But yes, so I think yeah, having somebody on the team besides Lady Gaga that he could be into, like I said, young ethnic type on the team, or somebody similarly trapped as him. He's basically he's MIT, but believes in ghosts. And now he's in a trash can with old dad bods and idiots and never was and one hot chick. Because, again, that's call centers for your ass. Never was people who don't believe they're losers. One absolutely smoke show. And, then you know, that, that's, that's your real Selena Gomez brand. role right there. That's <laughs> Selena Gomez. <laughs> All right. Where did that suggestion come from, Ron? Why? Why Selena Gomez? I like her. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think she's yeah. probably better than I. You know, I just always wonder, like, when you see a character who's uh, uh, an actress who's just been given specific roles over and over again, could they do something different if they were given a different task? Like, I, I we don't. You'll never know if she could have been good in something because we've only seen her do this specific type of thing. So I, I don't know. I, I wonder if she could be good at it. Well, by all accounts, I never saw the movie, but she like she did that movie with Paul Rudd uh, where they're on a road trip with a kid in a wheelchair and she was supposedly great in that. So I don't. What about um, just as the last um, Maya Erskine from Pen 15? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like her. I could definitely see her. She's she's really pretty. I know they kind of make her look kind of funny in the in that show, but she's really pretty. She's obviously super smart she's funny like i definitely think she's she's you know right in the in the sweet spot in terms of like being a a appropriate age level for like john boyega see i was actually going to suggest um caitlin deaver who is the non-beanie feldstein lead in book smart she looks so young well, again, if we're if the Ghostbusters are sort of this mishmash, I mean, I don't care. She could be still in college. You know, she's of age. She's probably going to be 21 in the movie. And Boyega's playing 25, 26. Yeah. And like, this is literally her summer job. Or she's only there because um, um, Matt LeBlanc is her dad or her uncle or something. So she's just sort of been dragged into it, you know. But she's just, but she ends up being there you know, she's got more going on than she gives herself credit for. Boyega helps her, you know, get it together. Maybe there's a romance. Maybe there's not. I don't know. That all tracks to me. I say that there is definitely a romance and that the twist is he doesn't end up with the MIB agent. And that's perfectly cool because they're still good buddies. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I mean, I, mean, I think you that think, can work you either think way, there's going to be something right. There's this tension of who he should be with or whatever. And then he does end up with her and then still just ends up friends with the other person. I don't know. I kind of, maybe I'm too old school. I just feel like that's so unsatisfying for like a summer blockbuster. Like, uh, like don't, that don't, don't Kevin Arnold and Winnie Cooper me at the end of this thing. Like <laughs> if you're going to string me along, like give me the layup at the end, send me home happy. You know? I mean, at risk of it being, uh, eh, like I said, if we're, I just, I would like it. I, I'm going to be naked in that. I want it to be somebody ethnic, especially if we're going with like, who's, who's going to be the lady in the MIB now. I'm, I'm losing it. Either Haley Steinfeld or, um, or Mackenzie Davis. So if it's going to so be that, that, if if it's that, it's that damn super Americana sister wife, I would like for the one on the other team to be more, feel like she's more trapped, but at the same time, be classy like him. So what about somebody like Jimmy Chan from the, from the Eternals? She's, she's oh. top lining Eternals. She's beautiful. She's stately and her in a crappy call center with Matt LeBlanc leering at her. And so John Boyega comes on the scene. I just think that's beautiful on some cool with Jimmy Chan. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, Maya Erskine is also a good choice. I, um, I think that's good too. Yeah. It's like John Boyega is going to be like, damn, all of my all of my love interests are starting to look the same, <laughs> except little, <laughs> except small acts. But yeah, uh, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely love that. Uh, just, just getting more, more of a mix of people in there because, uh, yeah, the the, bo- the bottom of the barrel takes all kinds. So let's let's get to the last question then. Who? Uh, this is clearly a movie. I think we've we've. We haven't directly discussed whether this should be a movie, a show, a miniseries, or whatever, but it, 
it feels like we're talking about it as a movie, which I think is appropriate. I mean, yeah, we're doing this for Netflix, uh, Sony and Netflix. So it feels like a really high caliber Netflix movie. Totally. To me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So who's directing? Who, who do we want in helming this ship other than the obvious choice of Jason Reitman? Uh, who do we? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Um, is Dan Aykroyd busy? <laughs> is Todd McFarlane busy? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, we, once we get into some of these, like this is a, this is a more particular job. Uh, I have a I have a, a suggestion. Um, okay. What about and this is you would think he'd be a star in this movie, but I think it's just behind the camera. What about Seth Rogen? I think one of my favorite comedies to come out in the last ten ish years was This Is the End, and I think he does have like that. He's just about to tackle Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like Are I you definitely. Really? Yeah, he just no announced kidding. as of the recording today. Um, I think he just has that right sensibility. And I think he has kind of the nostalgia, but also like he's just a funny guy. I think he gets comedy. I think he can clearly handle these kind of like he did an apocalyptic end of the world comedy and it was hysterical. So that's my pick. That's a really good pick, actually. I forgot that he and uh, and his and his Evan Goldberg. partner Adam Goldberg yeah. co-directed that movie. And yeah. actually, that makes me think that like Danny McBride should have a role in this movie for sure. Like you could definitely pull from his regular coterie of uh, co-conspirators to put in this movie. I mean, I like Danny McBride. I would just have be like a guy who wants to be a ghostbuster so bad. And even they're just like, uh, huh, yeah, sure. It's just kind of a runner joke throughout the whole thing. And then finally he gets to be one at the end, you know, or he's, or he's like the super Dick MIB agent. Who's like constantly deriding the ghostbuster. You know, you essentially yeah. give him the, <laughs> the peck role from the original ghostbusters to just be like, Oh, these idiots, these absolute clowns, you know, he's that guy. Yeah, I think Seth Rogen could direct the hell out of this thing. Absolutely. That's a really good no, choice. I got no better idea, so that works for me. No, no, I, I'm just leaning on his production of The Boys. I think he he really, him and his team and hiring Kripke and stuff, they really got the best out of the comic book property, The Boys, and they really put the best of it up on screen, and they made changes that were really good and smart. So that's kind of why I agree. I think he gets what's good about this product, just like he got what was good about The Boys. I think he would get what's good about this. And he gets the Jensen Ackles rules. Bam! I was going to say before I was so rudely interrupted by Jensen Ackles that um, <laughs> it should go. It should be noted that Seth Rogen and Adam Goldberg have really Evan. been behind Evan Goldberg. A- Adam is the TV show. The Goldberg guy. Also good though. I also Adam a great Goldberg show. In this movie. Yeah. yeah why not? Uh, but no, but uh, Seth and Evan have, have are like huge in genre media. They were the executive producers who brought to the screen, not only the boys, but invincible um, preacher, like yep. these guys have got cred. So I, I, I think we've come to the end of the road, and I'm just going to say it: we've achieved reboot. We have a blockbuster reboot of Ghostbusters to supplant the upcoming blockbuster reboot of Ghostbusters, <laughs> going straight to Netflix, courtesy of our boss Amy Pascal and her ex studio current employer Sony Pictures. We have John Boyega and either Mackenzie Davis or Haley Steinfeld as college graduate students who are studying xenobiology, aliens, in a world where the men in black have gone public and they are both on track to join the MIB. But John Boyega's open mind to things like ghosts gets him a black mark in the MIB tryout and he does not make the team while his best friend slash love interest goes on to do so. Because he needs a job to stay in the country, he ends up where all of the washout paranormal hunters end up with the Ghostbusters, long since abandoned by the original creators and existing now almost more as a huckster team, just trying to milk people for money than as a actual paranormal control uh, group. When a TikTok video goes viral, where culturally appropriating white girls manage to inadvertently summon a demon, 
or actually summon a demon because they're witches and they thought it would be sweet. Uh, a ticking clock begins to total demonic takeover of the world where the men in black led by the matriculated Winston Zeddemore find themselves unable to deal with it. Partly that's because Michael Keaton as the Men in Black partner to Haley Steinfeld or Mackenzie Davis gets possessed by the demon while trying to clean it up and goes on to, to sabotage the MIB's efforts at every turn. The MIB has no choice but to team up with the Ghostbusters who are on the trail wondering why isn't this being taken care of? How did this get swept under the rug? It brings them into conflict, but they have to reconcile their conflict to team up and save the world, thereby restoring not only only the Ghostbusters good name, but potentially the love sparks between Boyega and the MIB agent. Although if if some of us have our way, maybe he ends up with the uh, Maya Erskine or uh, Gemma Chan. Gemma Chan character who is uh, the one hot girl who's amongst all the losers at the Ghostbusters headquarters. <laughs> we are saying that this is going to be directed by Seth Rogen, leaning on his This Is The End chops. Uh, and overall, we think this is going to be a nice shot in the arm, mashing, out two, mashing up two great Sony properties for a new generation, keeping the comedy high while completely recontextualizing what you associate with either franchise. So... Miss Pascal, what do you think? No. No. Do you understand? You guys obviously forgot the interview with Seth Rogen was what got the studio hacked to begin with. And that began my downfall as the studio head. So no, you know what? I'm not going to be doing business with Seth Rogen anytime soon because Seth Rogen screwed me. Oh, oh I totally oh. forgot about that. I, me too. Well, maybe no, it we, wasn't that scandal. It was the other one. Maybe we don't go with Seth Rogen. Even if you don't go with Seth Rogen, there's still not nearly enough TikTok. I told you the whole movie is a TikTok video and you're not listening to me. It's because I'm a woman, you're not listening to me. And you know what? I don't do business with people who don't listen to me, okay? Reboot crew? Uh, you want the... It can't, the whole thing can't be a TikTok video. Yes, it can. Shut up. Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You know what? I'm so sick of your attitudes. I'm so sick of your attitudes. Why don't you just get the hell out? Because you're never going to work for Sony. And maybe you'll never work for Netflix. You bunch of jackasses. Goodbye. She kind of sounds like the Jack in the Box from... Uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Combined with Brian Leisure. <laughs> Out of here. Uh, Who? What is my that? head itches. My head itches. Oh. Well, back at it again next week. What can we say?